Well, hello, everybody. This is our, to us, we're a little impromptu pop up uh, talking about a victim of crime, sort of more an accidental death victims. Uh, some things have been released about Kobe Bryant and everyone who died in that tragic accident. Yesterday, a lot came out. So you guys were asking, hey, can you do a video about it? So here we are. I've got John Hill and Bulmer Funeral Director down in North Carolina. And I've got Ryan, who is a funeral director and embalmer down in Indiana. And one of the Ryan and Brian of Undertaking Podcast, who you guys know from all of our true crime episodes. So we're going to talk a little about some of the autopsy reports and just kind of give our feedback in things that we've seen um, in other situations. Welcome, guys. <laughs> hey, what's going on? Hey. <laughs> I was hey like, there. Hey there. <laughs> I, I, was, I was letting you go. I thought you were going. Oh, I know. yeah. She's the host. She's I know. Host. People she tell me I go talk on. too much, though, so I didn't want to be that person right now. But I was going to just give a little synopsis. So, Kobe Bryant and the eight other people who were on board the helicopter crashed into a hillside last, uh, I would have been January 26, 2020. So, it's now been two and a half years ago, which seems crazy because I remember when this happened. I mean, I'm not a big like basketball fan, but you know, I think everybody kind of knew Kobe Bryant, like and knew the name and everything. Do you guys remember like when this happened kind of as a moment? Oh, yes. Oh, it was yes. kind of, a, honestly, it was a big shocker, man. It was kind of the wind out of your sails kind of moment, almost like, you know, you remember where you were at it, it, it and I'm not comparing it to this, but, but understand you know, he, he was a, uh, a world known object, you know, yes. just, when he walked in, a, he had to have security everywhere he went, you know, one yeah. of those people. So, you know, I, I, I remember where I was at, you know, 9-11. I remember, uh, you know, where I was at certain and certain moments in life, you know, and it, it's one of those things where, you know, I was in my living room and then it just it, it scrolled across the screen and then immediately the TV went to, you know, breaking news. Um, you know, so it, it just kind of wild, man. And, and to think that somebody in your childhood that you grew up and you watched and, and you felt kind of, you were a part of the moment in certain aspects and rooted for, and, and, and were emotionally invested in, in certain aspects, you know, it, it's kind of, I think some people maybe thought they lost a hero in a lot of ways, you know what oh, I mean? So, yeah. you know, not, not me, but I'm just saying like it, it I can understand because I, I felt it and I wasn't that, I'm not that big of a sports fan, but it was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like yeah. unbelievable, like wildness, you know? Yeah, he was a, not just a hero and not just a legend, but an icon. He was maybe not Michael Jordan status, but there was always the debates who was better, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And, you know, I love basketball. Um, I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. But to me, Kobe Bryant's his tenacity, his drive for the love of the game, his competitiveness, his challengeness uh, is just, you know, un, unmatched outside of Michael Jordan, in my opinion. And I remember I was at work, just like you were saying, you know, where were you at when 9-11 happened? Uh, where were you at when Kobe Bryant died? I was at work and rumor was running around, you know, hey, Kobe Bryant died. I said, what? Ain't no way. And then – I started scrolling through news and going on the internet and then scrolling through Facebook. And sure enough, I mean, it was just like, no way. How in the world yeah. could someone like Kobe Bryant, as young as he was, yeah. and even though he had already retired from the game, um, he, you know, he was still doing big things and had big aspirations and was doing a lot of great things behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And what was even more tragic, not just that he died, but he also had – those seven others that died with him, mm -hmm. including one of his children, well, one of his. Eight. So there's nine total, including nine the, total. Yep, including the pilot. Okay, so including the pilot, you had eight more along with that, and one of those was also one of his children. I believe it was one of his daughters. Yeah, his daughter Gianna, and then her teammate. So there would, you know, so there was two teenage kids, and then a bunch of adults that were on this helicopter going to a game um yeah they were all a lot of you know they're all kind of connected in different ways through this um oh three sorry three daughters 
and all connected through, you know, the basketball and through playing and through Gianna and the youth basketball, which I think makes it even more of a story. You know, if this was just a random nine people on a helicopter, even if it was, you know, with the three kids and, and the whole story, it would be a story that made the news, but not had any longevity, but because it's Kobe Bryant, then yeah. all of this is being talked about and questioned and hey talk about this i remember when this happened and people were like you're going to talk about this carrie you're going to talk about this and i'm like i don't know what you guys want me to say like i i didn't have a lot to say to talk about it and i don't just talk about things to talk about them this instance i because i had so many requests last night i was like okay we'll talk about this i haven't talked about a helicopter crash yet so let's you know dive into it and so let's pull up. I sent the guys some stuff earlier. So we just had some reference. So what came out was this one page essentially thing from the autopsy report. And shocker, like if we hear helicopter accident, what do we think is going to be on the death certificate is death, cause of death? What do you guys? Blunt force trauma this is the initial, what I would always say. Yeah. And that's what they put on the death certificate was blunt trauma. It was accidental death on a hillside. That's what all of the autopsy reports said, um, that they all, you know, pretty much died on impact. His said, you know, blunt trauma of the head, multiple lacerations of face, scalp, neck, multiple fractures of skull and face, evisceration of brain, blunt trauma, chest, you know, just the trauma to the body is unlike any other. I don't know if I've seen a car accident that has this much trauma possibly. I mean, as big, I think reading the words sounds a lot bigger to me than what the diagram. I don't know. What do you guys give me your feedback on some of this that we're looking at? Go ahead, Ron. Well, I, I think you're looking at a, I mean, an, an absolute tragedy. Um, just from the embalming standpoint, you know, I think there's going to be multiple challenges there uh, just from what you, you told us. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of work, a lot of hours, a lot of man hours. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, I, I would think with a helicopter crash, you would have probably uh, burns uh, probably, or, or, or some sort of fire related, you know, I, I believe if in the video I saw smoke coming from from the area so i would assume there was some sort of a fire as well which is always present challenge it's challenge a challenge for us um you know so i i don't i don't know i i think you, you know in my experience i've never i've never had a helicopter crash uh now i've been on some pretty um i would say traumatic scenes as a paramedic and and ha had some pretty traumatic mass casualty incidents. Uh, but a helicopter crash, I think, is a different type of, of trauma. And, and it, you know, like, like you said, it sounds like he had immense, uh, just wild injuries, you know, it just c complete, you know, things that you probably, you're not going to see every day is, I guess, where I'm going with that. So, um, yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of challenge from the standpoint of, of preservation and, and making sure that we can get them to an acceptable, recognizable look. I mean, you know, you'd almost have to see where someone would, would be to, to be able to, to judge what you can do. Yes, I would imagine all of them had quite the variety of injuries. There's pictures on usatoday.com is one of the articles I pulled up that was from January 2021, kind of the one year anniversary, and it shows the helicopter after all the deceased had been removed and how burned and destroyed that helicopter is. So, you know, they're going to have been thrown, some of them thrown from it, some of them still encapsulated in it. The whole thing is not burned. So it kind of gives a good depiction of what is left of that helicopter and possibly some of them were still in that when it burned and had more extensive burns possibly than the others. But I know, John, you have worked, I've worked a couple airplane, smaller airplane crashes. You were talking 
when we were talking earlier today about an, um, working an airplane crash too, which would be kind of similar as a, you know, a small aircraft. Talk about that. So it actually wasn't an airplane. It was a helicopter. Oh, it was a helicopter. It was, it was, it was a helicopter. So with an airplane, um, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an aviation expert or anything, but just, you know, just common sense and thinking things through. Aviation is different because you got wings and they glide down. Helicopters, you don't. If something goes wrong with a helicopter, you're, I mean, you're going straight down. There's no wings. There's nothing like that. Um, and back in 2017, I was working at a firm that in Raleigh, North Carolina, where um, Duke Life Flight, in September 2017, Duke Life Flight had four paramedics on board, and the helicopter went down and just exploded, and all four were killed on impact. Um, it, was a, it was pretty tragic in our area, made headlines and news in our area. Um, out of the four paramedics that were killed, uh, two of those, two of those from the Duke Life Flight came to our firm mm. and they made a big deal out of it. Uh, we had um, the coach drive and pull in side. It was all airborne. Um, the highway patrol, everybody made a big deal wow. about it. It was televised and pulled right into the garage. Um, I remember the coach driver driving in, you know, how, you know, wonderful that was, a very powerful moment. Um, I wasn't on the news or anything, but I remember the funeral director said, John, I want you inside the garage, open the garage when I tell you to, and close the garage when I tell you to. <laughs> and and so I had the privilege of doing that. And then um, I had the privilege of being in, in the prep room when the bodies came in. And uh, it was a very powerful moment because, um, you know, the deceased, you know, went through such trauma and from an embalming standpoint and now reconstructive specialist standpoint, when you look at those cases, nine times out of 10, you have to go back and tell the family there's nothing you can do. But I know Ryan has been with me. I know Carrie, I don't know how much you've had with reconstruction, but I mean, Glenn Talon over in Ireland, when he said that if it's just down to the bones, I'm going to try to do something. I'm going to try. I'm going to yeah. try. And so um, now the only thing I would say about Kobe Bryant's situation, it does say that 30 percent of his body was burned. It does say that, which to me is not that much mm -hmm. in my estimation from that. Um, uh, when I see these reports and it's out there for the public to see these autopsy reports, um, I mean, unfortunately, he's had um, amputations done on his arm and then on both of his legs. Um, but there are ways that we are able to make them viewable in the casket of those things. OK, and um, the main obstacles that I would see in regards to this case is number one, obviously, the face and the hands. Well, we can do with that. You can always use gloves for the hands if you had to. Mm -hmm. Two, with the face, you've got the soft tissue, but you've got a lot of charring. It even says here he had a charred scalp. And when you have a charred scalp, I mean, you have to do some certain techniques to get that char off. And then also, you have to deal with the odor. You have to deal with the smoke of the odor, because I will never forget uh, having both of those bodies in 2017 and just the smell. Okay. And um, so that's, that's what happens. And uh, is it possible for you to do something? You can always try. You can always try. You can always try. So that's, I remember when they, this was all happening and like, okay, are they going to have funeral? What are they going to do? And there's such a variety of how someone can look after any kind of an accident. You know, you can have a car accident and the person look perfectly fine. You can have a car accident and the perfect person be shattered completely from the inside out. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's such a variety. And so I kind of wait, I kept waiting for like more information because people wanted me to talk about it. And I'm like, I don't even know what to talk about. Like there's, I have no specifics reading this though, when it talks about, you know, feet amputation, things like that. And I think those seem to most people 
so shocking. I think in his case, since his feet and his hands were what created his whole persona of, you know, his career, that his arms, you know, his arm being amputated, his feet, his legs, it, you know, it kind of took away a lot of who he was in some of that essence. Agree with that. Um, you know, one thing it says, there's no soot in the trachea or bronchi. He was not alive at all when exactly. this happened. He more than likely just died on immediately on impact um, just from the trauma. So that's kind of something that those little key things that no soot in the trachea or bronchi, lets a family know like your loved one didn't feel that part of it. They didn't, you know, experience that part. And that's kind of a comfort, even though I know it doesn't sound right, but it is. Ryan, what are you thinking about all this? You know, I, I, I almost, Carrie, you were talking about the idea just now, no, you know, no sit in the airway, which means, you know, he was probably, uh, he probably passed away pretty quickly, but you know, when you said that, I thought about that. I was, I'm thinking about, well, what about the ride down? Yeah. You know? that and and I, I just, I can, I, I don't, I don't ever want to imagine. I can't imagine, but um, to be there, you know, with, with your daughter and it, it just, uh, ugh, it just kind of makes you ill in a little, little bit, you know, that, that's what I, I thought of when you brought that up, you know, just, you know, I think realizing because in those helicopter crashes, they don't end well. None of them. I don't know that they, any of them have ended well. You you do have people that walk away from those, but, um, you know, they usually have some sort of life changing injury out of it. Um, you know, and, and the other thing I wanted to touch on, too, you talked about the idea of sometimes people can be seen and, and you know, pass away from it or die from an immense amount of trauma. And it doesn't necessarily have to be seen, you know, we've, we've seen in EMS, you know, the idea of the, the internal decapitation, you see that in IndyCar, some of mm-hmm. these racers, um, because of the G force of driving and then the sudden stop, uh, you know, they're, and they look fine coming out of these cars, but they, you know, there's been a complete break of that spinal column within, you know, the, yeah. the, well, within their body because all that force. So, you know, there's a lot of things we can do, but there's also, a lot of ways people can pass away that um, may not look traumatic from the outside, but have been immensely internally. So, you know, mm-hmm. there, there are a lot of factors, you know, I think John's right. Charring, I mean, depending on where the charring is, um, deformities, what we have left and, and you know, kind of the, what do we have to build on? Uh, you know, those are all things that, that are going to be factors in, to, in a lot of ways, you know, viewing, you know, we can always try, uh, you know, but, you know, there's times too, where I, I think that, you know, I'm never going to discourage anybody. Um, but, you know, I, I think too, that there are moments where maybe we can't do enough to really make it right. So maybe the best thing is, you know, to, to not bear witness to this, you know, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I, I, I didn't see the guy, you know, um, you know, there's, yeah. Some families, and that's, and that's it. Yeah, you know, there's some families that that want to see, you know, sometimes just want to see a, a fingertip or a hand or a tattoo, just to know it's them. You know, we we've done that before, where we've had an immense amount of trauma, and and the family did not want to see uh, see their loved one's face, but wanted to know it was them. Spend some time with them, uh, you know, and 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 see a, a tattoo on the hand to know it was them. Touch them. And just know that that was their loved one's hand in a lot of ways. And, and that was healing for them. That was grieving for them. So, um, you know, sometimes maybe it's not just the reconstruction of, of, you know, you know, the face and the skull. Maybe sometimes it's, you know, putting something together to where a family can realize that's their loved one and, and they can at least have a moment, you know, so whether that's a moment where they see them face to face or, or touching their hand, it's still a moment. One thing I think about with this type of an accident, whether it's plane, helicopter, any anything like this, you're not there within like five minutes and taking the body and getting the body in a cold, you know, storage within a brief amount of time. Yeah. Often these deceased 
are going to be exposed to elements for potentially, you know, hours. I've had days where trying to extract from the space that the person was in, it was a two day time frame in 110 degree heat in a swamp. Like that's that alone. It doesn't matter what they look like, just that being in the elements in that kind of temperature and weather and think that was more detrimental, I think, than the accident probably could have been to their condition. So that's another factor is how long is it going to take to get some of these people, parts, things extracted together? Can you do anything once, you know, during a certain period of time is another factor to me that I think about with this. As well. well, it can be it can be hours on end before you get the first responders oh, that yeah. are that can handle the situation because, like you said, the terrain. Depending on the terrain, you know, you may have to hike up a few miles into a mountain or, or whatever else. And it sounds like the terrain where they were at was pretty remote. Um, exactly, that's exactly so it, what I was going to say. Yeah. It's it's not like you're going to get help right away. I mean, it's it's just not um, unless somebody's airdropping something. But that's that would that would be the only only option I would think, because it, it just, you know, I've, I've heard of, of doing recoveries and trying to get up to places where, you know, planes have crashed into mountains and, and they chain the plane to the mountain, you know, so it doesn't go anywhere, you know, because they can't remove it. There's no way it took hours to get up there. Um, you know, so some of these places you may, you're right. Days that, that, that could be very accurate. Actually, I don't want to say it could, that is very accurate days. Sometimes it takes days to get, just get there. Well, and it's not like this helicopter with these nine bodies in it fell and they're all going to be right there. You have this impact and outward where you have to keep radiating out and looking for every piece of debris and human possible parts that may have been thrown pressure, I don't know, not pressurized, but you, you know what I mean? From the, the impact and the blow and the everything, there's, there's so much to it that I keep, as I'm looking at these pictures, thinking more and more about, I would love though, I think all, you know, all of us in how we are would probably love to kind of see him and be like, can we do something here? Exactly. <laughs> like try Take try, the challenge. Got to try exactly. exactly. You know? Can I say and one what, thing? And what, oh, and what yeah. Ryan said, go ahead, Ron. I, I do want to add it, when John, when you said that you know his arm, because I don't have that report right in front of me right now. No, you're when fine. you said that his arms and his legs were missing, I mean that that is a gut punch. That is, yeah. you know, for, for some reason it, it just is. When it says they were they were found, I mean both feet yeah. were recovered. But, but being amputated, like you said, that's yeah. so much identity there, you know? Oh, yeah. And how true that is, you know, with him, what Carrie just mentioned about, you know, what he did for a living. That's, yeah, it's, to me, it's I almost. I mean, you know, and it's almost. Injury. It's, yeah. it's almost, um, it's really, it was surreal for me when I found out he died. I was like, what? And then how he died. Are you kidding me? Like the fuck. Kobe Bryant. That's exactly. Yeah. Yep. I mean, are are you kidding me? This this great icon of basketball, and he just didn't die just a normal death or something just happened with him abnormally inside of his body. He had a helicopter crash. Yeah. And you don't get a chance to see him again. He's just. I mean, I and and, and but not. And I don't mean this pun intended, but it literally is poof yeah he's gone yeah he's gone and you see the news crews out there seeing the helicopter on fire the smoke i mean he's gone and it was just unimaginable and going back to what you said earlier ryan i've just been thinking about this you know our rule as embalmers is if we're going to have a viewing they need to be viewable acceptable and recognizable. We've had that drilled into us all the time. And we talked about Natalie Holloway last mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And what, and what is that phrase? Seeing is believing. 
And there is no doubt you can't tell me that Kobe Bryant's wife, the rest of his children, all of his family, his friends, everybody that spoke at his memorial service, you cannot tell me that when the last time they talked to any of them and any of, of Kobe and all of them, that they thought that was the last time. Yeah. That was the last time. And same thing with Natalie Holloway's parents. Um, bye, Natalie. We'll see you when you get back from Aruba. But she doesn't come back. Mm-hmm. And you cannot tell me that they do not want to have that one last time. Seeing is believing. They really have died. And, um, you know, and I just, even though they had a service and they have con- confirmation that this is Kobe's body, this is his children's body, this is all of their bodies. Um if they could have that one chance, that one opportunity. And that's why we, what we do as embalmers and as funeral directors and as funeral professionals and not just professionals, all of us on here and Brian's not on here tonight, but Brian too, we're practitioners. We just don't talk the talk. We walk the walk and we do our best to just try. Let us try to do something because there's no telling what we can do if we just simply try, you know, to get the body in our care, to give them that bath, to try our best to start the preparation process, see where it goes, to see where it leads. Yes, there's a big challenge, but you know, I would want to at least try to do something to be up to the challenge. And if they wasn't viewable, acceptable and recognizable, then you you would go back to the family and just tell them so. But they would definitely, as Ryan mentioned, you know, it looks on here that his arm probably had it looks like they did have some abrasions and some burning marks but on that one side you know those same hands that held a basketball and those same hands that you know clasped and held hands with his wife and children they may have been able to hold the hand you just you just never ever know what we could do and that's why what we do is so very very important Another thought um, to throw out, so as I was trying to find his autopsy report, because of course you Google Kobe Ryan autopsy report, you get a million things that are not on point, but other autopsy reports getting brought up, which made me just think of some other, like um, Paul Walker. I mean, that was another big. um, That's a big one too. Big. And so, you know, he died in a very obscure way, but so on point for how he had kind of gone with his life and cars and racing and all this stuff with his movies. And then also Dale Earnhardt, which you were talking about, we were talking about kind of that impact where it's internal and what someone might look like in that. And that is another that, like I have goosebumps talking because it's such a culture with racing that that death was I mean, oh, yeah. come on. that you, is a, you, you realize I'm in North Carolina. I, yes. The right. One of the racing capitals of the world. And he one. lives. One. He, uh, well, one. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Indy. Indy I, I know where it. the racing capital of the world is, buddy. <laughs> I know where well, it is. All, all, right. all I can tell, all I can tell you though, you may be NASCAR, but it, I know what the racing there, capital. Is. There you go. Okay. There. IndyCar, NASCAR, we get it. But uh, as far as Dale Earnhardt goes, it is religion. And where I'm based out of now in Huntersville, in Charlotte area, Dale Earnhardt's from. And Dale Earnhardt died at Daytona, but he flew back to Huntersville in the same town. And the funeral director, the owner of the funeral home that I worked for, he was not quite there at the funeral home at the time, but he worked at the funeral home that took care of Dale Earnhardt. And Dale Earnhardt is buried just up the road from where I live at, not too far away. He has his own private mausoleum and everything. I know we're getting off track a little bit here, but you're talking yeah. about Dale Earnhardt and all of that. That is so true what happened with him. And um, so, so anyhow, anyway. There's just He's so got his own mausoleum, like, like a huge mausoleum. Like it's locked. Yeah, it sure is. Um, like, I can't it's, get in. Dale on Earnhardt, Earnhardt, you can't, you can't, you can't <laughs> go see. And that's what uh, I know. It's probably very frustrating with the racing capital of the world with that and people that love NASCAR with Dale Earnhardt. 
But Dale Earnhardt's not buried in a public cemetery. Dale Earnhardt is buried on private property in his own private mausoleum. Mm. And the only and the only way you can see it, I think there's a picture floating around of a of a plane or something. Uh, it wasn't a drone, but a plane or something that took a picture of the mausoleum. Hmm. And uh, that's all you can. Nobody's allowed to Are go near that serious? mausoleum. I'm dead serious. Yep. I he's didn't. buried right there at near Lake Norman Lake, where is yep. That's Start where Googling at. everybody. Google, Google, look. Well, next yeah. somebody had messaged me this week. It was a back and forth interchange, um, which is only Tuesday. So it's been a few days of this, where they were asking about um another video he had done about a specific somebody and like how can I get their death certificate? Where can I look more into this? I've looked about this and I've looked about that. Why can't I get more? And I'm like, celebrity use a lot of the same funeral homes and they require that respect and that reverence and their, that privacy from the funeral. Privacy. And that's why a lot of them use the same funeral home in, you know, New York. And that's why all the politicians use the same funeral homes because they know that the privacy goes through every level of everybody that's working there. Like there's not leaked things about, you know, people for the most part from the funeral homes. They're all locked down in there, but it's not just for celebrity. You know, we always think, oh, they've got to be so much more. And it's like, you can't think of them like that. I think when you're caring for people of a certain you know, caliber or, you know, um, is, exposure. Is, yeah. yeah like, that you just have to do what you do, take care of the body, take care of the family. And then the rest will work itself out. There's going to be a media person. There's going to be people who come in from their team to help oversee some of that. It's not just one funeral director jumping in, taking care of all of that. That just doesn't happen that way. Hey, I want to ask you guys, like when you go on vacation, as a funeral director, I know what my father and I do, and I'm going to tell a story here, but we went to Palm Springs and I, I, I go to, we go to cemeteries on vacation every, every now and again, um, but had the opportunity to go to, I, I believe it's called Desert Palms, um, but the cemetery where Jilly Rizzo, Frank Sinatra, um, Sonny Bono, bunch of different celebrities are buried and got pictures next to their grave spaces and yeah. all that. Dude, it, it was so cool. There's such a story behind it. I dig that. It absolutely infuriates me that Dale Earnhardt's grave you can't get to. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I, I like that. That I, I've been to Jimi Hendrix's grave, man, it, which yeah. it was awesome. It was, I mean, the build of it, how they did it, the tribute to him, the guitar, I, I love the story behind it, you know, because you hear so much history. Um, I'd love to go see Ben Franklin's grave. I, I enjoy yeah. that. It, it, is that it? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's got a fence around it. Told you. Are I you kidding it, it, me? I'm not kidding you, buddy. I told you. It is <laughs> black. You, dude. And it is literally like, here's the butter. Um, can you see that? And it like, is elaborate. It is too. in the middle. It, it took of them a little. It took nothing. them a little bit to build that too. It's exactly. Oh it my is god! Its own, it's its own shrine all to itself, and um, so so yeah, that's it. Do you and know speaking, anybody that's in there? Uh, not necessarily. I could talk to Sam, uh, my uh, guy who I work for, my good friend. <laughs> um, so. I could, I could talk to him more about stuff, but uh, I don't know anybody that's necessarily been there. I do know the funeral home that he worked for or eventually went there because they had to take the casket there and bury him there in that mausoleum. Of course, or not buried, sorry, not buried, entombed. He's entombed there in the how mausoleum. Mis how mysterious is that? He's in a grave space in the middle. It has, has to do with his family. has to do with his wife. So that's all you can say. That's all I know what to say because she's the direct next to Ken. Now we all know what today is though, right? Isn't Carrie, do you know what today is though? Talking about irony of us talking about celebrities or someone that has died. You know who died today? 45 years ago. Oh, Elvis. The king. The king. Yes, I saw something the about that earlier. I was like, died. Yeah, oh. the king. And I've been there. I've been to Graceland. 
Uh, very, very neat place to go. If you've never been, you need to go. Um, Someone's, I mean, people have asked for Elvis us to is just amazing that on this, this series that we do. Well, we, we need to because there's also a debate. Is Elvis in the second story? Because you can't go to the second story of Graceland. It is unallowed. Elvis never allowed people to go to the second floor in his home. So everybody's wondering, is Elvis still working upstairs every single day, seeing who all is visiting him? <laughs> all that kind of story. All, as Ryan likes to say, the folklore. The folklore. I love it, I love it man. It, it, the story, I, I just love hearing the story behind stuff, man. I just... I dig it. I fall in love with it. It just, it hits me right, man. I'm mean, part of the podcast. We do that. You know, I love it. I just, I dig hearing the history behind certain things and especially stuff like that, you know, in grave yeah. spaces, like I, I, I don't know, man, I, we've been, I've, I just visit cemeteries and, and I feel like there's so much history in these places and we don't appreciate it enough. So um, I don't know. I think it's cool. I really do. When I do I went, too. When I was in Paris, that's my one, we were there for such a short period of time. And that was my one big regret about that trip was not getting to go to Jim Morrison's grave because oh. I loved the doors. So like high school, my room was all doors posters. Like I was obsessed with Jim Morrison and the doors just can love them. And I, it was just too much. It was too far. And that cemetery is huge to try and find where he was and stuff we just didn't have time i i regret not making time for that but now, now getting back i guess to our initial conversation Sorry. with kobe yeah. no 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 um what happened to kobe as far as his disposition it was he was him and his daughter cremated were they buried I Are they, do they, they have a place? Cremated. They, they've got a place in a cemetery. I've seen it on on line. Okay. It's a pretty elaborate uh, place. I mean, it's. I think it's its own kind of boxed off section, um, if I recall. So but you can, so you can visit there publicly if you wanted to see Kobe's grave. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'm trying to find. I'm like googling. I didn't even look at that part um, when I was looking at stuff, just because. Uh, well, as you're looking, well, as you're looking at it, well, as you're looking at it, Carrie, I will say this: I have uh, just for everyone on the channel here and our viewers, we have people that wonder about cremated remains and having their urn of their loved one, and I do try to guide them if I can to put them in a permanent place, yeah. put them in a permanent spot at a cemetery. We've had people come to the cemetery, or excuse me, come to our funeral home, and literally they have eight urns they tell us they have eight urns that has been passed down to them and they literally tell us we don't know what to do with them what should we do and a part of your lineage and a part of your heritage a lot of your family tree um, a lot of your websites that look up your family tree how they look those up is through cemeteries yeah. they're able to track them through cemeteries but if you don't have a cemetery if you don't have a permanent place that's on record a lot of your family tree gets lost and hidden because the urn is either with, with the family or the urn could be scattered. There's no record of what happened to the people. So I encourage you, even if you do have the cremation and you have the urn, which nothing's wrong with that, you do what, what you feel like you need to do is best, uh, try to have a place because those places are permanent. They're gonna last throughout time. And it's they're all, your loved one's always gonna be remembered because they're in that permanent place. I, so, I would what you find have it have it documented as, as wanting to do or doing something and have hey, some yeah. sort of paperwork documented because you got people that are buried at sea, you've got you know the scatter, you scattering, yeah. you know. So just have it documented, I think, as to there was a disposition. How about that? So I'm That's reading good. um just for the Kobe Bryant info. Okay, him and Jenna were laid to rest at Pacific View Memorial Park in Corona Del Mar, California. Um, and it's in a, so it looks like they were buried and they're next to each other and it's in, so if you go to Cal, this going to the one huge cemetery in LA, this was kind of the big thing is you purchase like your own individual little thing, kind of like we see here in the Midwest where there's like corner posts and stuff, but it's not high. So there's, it's maybe like a hip high border. 
and then a locked gate. So yes, you could get up to the headstone if you jumped over this gate. It's not that high for you to get over. Hopefully people respect that space and don't jump in there and stuff, but it, there's lots of pictures. I'm on radaronline.com backslash photos backslash Kobe hyphen Bryant hyphen burial hyphen site hyphen exposed backslash. I'll put the link in the the comments or the, there you go yeah. yeah can't you follow that come on do, 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 do. um but it shows a lot of pictures of their burial space and the headstone and everything very simple the headstone and and the space and such so um john wayne's buried at the same cemetery it says so nice the day yeah. of the cemetery um yes it's connected to a funeral home to a it's a dignity cemetery and mortuary so big rolling hills um it does it looks like the ones that i've been to in like the la area which i that's my whole context of california is really out and around that Ooh, out and around the la area and stuff so um but that's what it very much reminds me of is that area so and i don't know where corona del mar or whatever is um or whatever that was if i clicked back there but it might be near there i'm not sure well, I can't believe it's been that long. That's crazy. Yeah, two and a half years. That's just. And that was right before COVID. Wasn't that like the pre-COVID tragedy? Yes, because mm -hmm. that was January. And then March is when COVID went in our worlds. So it was right before. Because they still had, they had the memorial service at the Staples, I think the Staples Center. Um, yep. And had all of that before COVID went crazy. Um, yeah, February 24th. So if it had been one month later, it would not have been able to happen. And that was a very moving service. I watched it and um, yeah. it was very, very moving and all the speeches and things. It's just, it's just remarkable that he's gone. And just the way that he's gone was just, it, it still is mind boggling to me. It's just I amazing. Can't, I can't imagine as Vanessa, you know, his wife and John's mom too, get up in such a public platform and because I believe she spoke at it but just to like mm -hmm. have to go through that type of a loss not just one person publicly, but publicly. your baby your spouse your future and do it yeah so publicly and with such scrutiny because every every evil about him every good everything is coming out of the woodwork because media just is ugly when it comes to things and doesn't always paint the person in the best picture. And like the pilot was destroyed in the media for a while, even though there was no drugs, there was no alcohol, there was no anything. It was completely accidental. And they just bashed him immediately. Like it had to be somebody's fault, you know, just media does evil things sometimes. And they, they so, feed on the negative things for sure. Yeah. So to go through, I think all of that in the wake of losing somebody also that just getting me talking about the media gets me all sorts of it's just terrible just terrible but well thank you guys for jumping on with me kind of um randomly last minute and discussing this i think it's something people have wanted for a while is us chatting about it and uh this and is i think we got other good topics to talk about next time we may need to go deeper into the Taylor and hard the king we got all kinds of other stuff out of it too, but uh, you know, again with Kobe Bryant, you know, it's just so sad and so tragic, and his family, and they're still having to move on from this. And I know all of us have moved on as a society, but even when you reflect on it, it's just still surreal and unreal to believe. And then, but there is no doubt in my mind, his family, especially his wife and his, and the rest of his children, they're just they're still at a loss. And they always you never recover. I don't think from never, never. Yeah. Well, so. and there's still, I mean, right now is the, this coming out two and a half years later, because there's a court case going on right now with the police department or the fire department having taken pictures and sharing them on cell phones and things. And that's yeah. all in the court right now. So two and a half years later, they're still having to drudge up every emotion that's raw was raw in that moment with hearing all this stuff again and being exposed to it again and never getting to kind of 
heal those wounds because it keeps getting opened, 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 which is horrible for anybody that has to go through that. But as, but as I'll, I'll end with this, just as embalmers and as funeral professionals, um, that's what the family does when something, when this happens, when this tragedy took place, Kobe Bryant's wife said, I got to call a funeral home. She said, I, the, the police, the investigators, they had to ask her, you know, the medical examiner's office, where you want your husband? Mm -hmm. Where do you want your daughter? They call us. They call us to take care of the dead. They call us to take care of their precious loved one. And so that's an honor of what we do as embalmers. That's an honor of what we do as funeral professionals, practitioners is that, you know, there had to have been a funeral director or someone that representing the family step in front and take care of Kobe, take care of his daughter. And so that's a very humbling and honoring thing that we get to do to help the family during their most difficult and most devastating time, just like this. Yeah. Getting that call, getting the call. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thanks to John and his expertise and putting in and thanks for Ryan and giving all your input and check out undertaking the podcast on any podcast platform with Ryan and his cohort, Ryan, who couldn't make it tonight and check us out on the next one, guys. And bye. thank you, Carrie. Thank You're you welcome. too, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Bye guys. <laughs> See bye. -bye. <laughs>